Hello, this is Kwang Lee from Seoul National University. In this presentation, we are going to present our recent work called Constraint Guided Directed Gray Box Posing, or simply CDGF, which augments directed gray box posing with constraint. Uh, before we start the presentation, I want to inform you that I'm looking for a poster, a poster position. So if you are looking for a poster candidate, please let me know. Before we discuss about directed posing, let me recap a conventional gray box posing. Uh, the conventional gray box posing is the bug finding technique where you inject random inputs to the program, and as a response, you get the, you get the cost coverage feedback from the program. Uh, you can use this feedback to recognize and reserve interesting inputs, and repetitively try these interesting inputs after slightly modifying parts. And you can finally achieve the POC inputs that reveals the latent bugs in the program. And you see that the gray box posing aims at discovering unknown bugs, which suggests that you cannot determine which bug will be eventually discovered or not. But what if, what if you already have a bug in mind that you want to inspect further, like you have a bug, you already know a bug in the program? Uh, in this case, Exploring the specific site uh, intensively can solve this problem, but you, you cannot obviously achieve this goal with a conventional gray box poly. And actually, it turns out that uh, those situations are pretty common in practice. Uh, the prime example would be reproducing a crash that is reported by users. Uh, consider those reports are not accompanied by the POC input. In that case, you need to reproduce the vulnerability from the scratch, but naturally it's very hard because you only know a crash site or basic diagnostics. Not only that, the technologists can also report you some suspicious site, but you cannot believe in those sites right away because they are very notorious for its password delayed. So you may want to verify its authenticity by inspecting the reported site further. Meanwhile, uh, if you are not a developer but an attacker, uh, you, you still can encounter such a case when you, you, when you want to exploit a vulnerability whose relevant code sites are revealed by fixed commits. So what do you need in fudging to achieve them? Uh, first, we need to clarify that there can be multiple target sites involved in a specific purpose where those sites must be listed in order. Uh, for example, constantly producing a user after free crash uh, where the free site needs to be listed first uh, before reaching the use site. Uh, now consider those two inputs where the yellow input yellow input unleashes the use site, but the blue input reaches the free site first and the use site later. Given such two inputs, we naturally uh, we can naturally think that we need to prioritize the blue input more because the blue input at least frees the pointer before it's used. But that's not the end of the story actually. Uh, now suppose reproducing a HIPAA flow, flow crash. Uh, in this case, again, the blue input is more valuable because it at least touches the vulnerable archive site first. But you can, you can easily conceive that there is a definitive data condition involved to a HIPAA flow, flow which indicates the boundary of the buffer. Now suppose that the blue input we already found is unfortunately Paired with i equal 5. Uh, in this case, the data condition is not yet satisfied, so, so we need to fuzz in more. But uh, what if there is yet other blue input with i equals 10? In this case, those blue inputs satisfy the data condition as well as the touching both sides. So naturally, we can think that we must prioritize, it, prioritize this input the most. So now that we checked the two requirements for our purpose, let's see how CJF incorporates them to fudging. 
First, let's start with base line. Uh, we use a conventional directed gray box fuzzing or simply DJ app. And for simplicity, we will continue this discussion using these four inputs in the table. And at this moment, uh, we only set a tar single target at the use side because DJ app cannot recognize multiple order tag size. And now going back to DJ app, uh, it determines how close an input is to the target by measuring the distance on the control block. Um, are you sure what it means? Uh, for example, the green impulse has, a, has zero distance because it only touches the target size. On the other hand, the yellow and blue impulse has a distance of one because in each, uh, it approaches the target site as close as one control flow from the target. You see, the, short, the shorter the distance is, the more prioritized the input should be. But actually, you can notice the problem here because even if the blue input touches the allocation site, it is deprioritized as much as the yellow input, which does not touch the allocation site in the first place. So now this requires all the target size in the picture. We now set the priority target side to the allocation side so that we can measure how far the a given input is from the allocation side. For example, the yellow input is far from the allocation side by one, while the blue input touches the allocation side. Uh, but actually, this along the side enforces the orderness of the targets. But if we max this out, the distance of the later target side, if it hasn't reached the prerequisite site, we can, we can achieve the orderness of the uh, multiple targets. Then you can see that the yellow and the blue inputs are finally put in the right priority classes. But the green inputs are still in the same priority, while the one in i equals 10 is obviously better than the other green input because it satisfies the crashing data condition. To solve this problem, we must see how, a, how close a given input is to the data condition. In this example, a condition requires i as large as 10, so the green input with i equals 10 is closer to the data condition. So to, to distinguish them, uh, we need to incorporate an integer dis distance to the data condition. Uh, where a input has a longer distance when it's farther from the condition. In this example, the green input with i equal 5 has a distance of 5 because it's short by 5 to the threshold condition, while the, green in, the other green input has no data distance because it already satisfies the condition. With this data distance, you can see that uh, we finally put all the inputs in the right priority classes with the green input with i equals 10 prioritized the most. Well, now let's put them all together to construct a single distance metric. To do this, uh, notice that these target size and data conditions can be described as a list of constraints on the left. Uh, we, and then you can define the distance of this constraint list by summing up all the distance from the constituting sub-constraints. Uh, and actually, you can see that the, the resulting constraint distance are none other than in the priority order, uh, where the shorter distance suggests the higher priority. This means that we can prioritize any combination of constraints with a single distance metric. So, how is it useful to have a single distance metric? In fact, this realizes a variety of targeted purposes only if they can be described with constraint. For example, by simply setting multiple order target size, we can reproduce use after free, double free, and initialize value crashes only with crash dumps that specifies relevant cost size. Furthermore, two target size and a date condition can be utilized to reproduce buffer of crashes, again only with crash dumps.
and you can actually utilize this setting to verify static analyzers on where the bleed force specified the target size and the crashing date conditions. Finally, even if multiple target sites are not available, uh, we can utilize one target site and a date condition to reproduce divided by zero and assertion failure crashes. And you can even use, utilize this setting to generate the POC inputs. Uh, we prototyped this on AFR and implemented the distance instrumentation using an LLVM IR plans. And using this prototype, we related 48 reward crashes and 20 fixed commits against the state of the art DJF system April Go. And actually, it turns out that our prototype outperforms April Go by 2.88 times in reproducing crashes and 3.65 times in generating POC inputs. To wrap this up, we'd like to point out that a conventional DJF system still lacks the necessary mechanisms for target disposing, namely the order target size and data conditions. On the other hand, our constraint-based distance metric called CDGF incorporates those requirements based on the uh, conventional DJF, and it turns out that the prototype system of CDGF outperforms DJF to a significant level. Thank you for listening to my presentation and I will be pleased to answer your questions.